We're done? Okay. Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Um, this video is gonna look a little different and have a different vibe today because we're actually gonna be doing a book review. I just finished the audiobook of Jeanette McCurdy's I'm Glad My Mom Died and I have a lot of thoughts about it, so let's chat. Now, before we get to talking about the book, I want to address content warnings. This is ironically like sort of a light kind of funny read, but there's a lot of heavy topics addressed in here. So trigger warning for substance abuse, eating disorders, parental abuse, um, anything like that. So I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McCurdy is an autobiography. It's actually narrated by her in the audiobook, which is pretty cool. And it's basically a timeline of her life as a child actor. It starts out with her mom when she's going to auditions for things like commercials, her experience as a background actor, as a, you know, a six or seven year old. And then it kind of takes a journey through the iCarly fame and through the end of Sam and Cat and while she's telling those stories, she's also telling the story of her relationship with her mom. And of course, because it's a story about the life of a child actor, there's a lot of anecdotes about what that life involves when you're on a set for a very powerful and well-known children's network. And Jeanette McCurdy talks about her time on iCarly and her experiences with the creator of iCarly. She refers to him as the creator, presumably for legal reasons. I am also going to be doing the same and I'm going to be taking it one step further by not referring to the channel that iCarly is on by its name. We're going to be calling it the network just to protect myself. So in the first third of the book or so, it's kind of pre iCarly and we set the scene in California. Jeanette is living with her pretty big family, uh, their Mormon family. She lives with her brothers and her mom and her dad and her grandparents are involved in the picture as well. And Jeanette describes her home life as not great. She was often looking to go to church to escape her home life. There was a lot of tension due to financial issues and that caused a strain on the relationship between her dad and her mom. Her dad was often kind of aloof and far removed from his kids' lives. And her mom was kind of poising herself to be the ultimate caretaker of the family and knowing what's best for the family. And that definitely plays a role in the whole family dynamic throughout the book. And Jeanette describes how she never actually really wanted to act at first. It wasn't an aspiration of hers. It was actually an aspiration of her mom, Deb, when Deb was a kid. Um, but her parents wouldn't let her go into acting. And so Deb kind of took that as a slight against her personally and kind of started this crusade to be like, well, I'm gonna do what's right for my kids, even if it's not necessarily what they want. So when Deb asks Jeanette, hey, do you wanna go into acting? Jeanette's already coming at it from the place of, I need to please my mom, I need to make my mom happy to keep this whole ship rolling, to keep the family together. And she says, yes. Eventually, Jeanette starts picking up some steady work as a child actor, but it took a lot to get to that point. Her mom enrolled her in acting classes and dance classes and would take her to Rite Aid to do maintenance trips for her looks, just to get her to look the part and be the part and book more work consistently, which Deb was using to basically pay their entire family's bills. So Jeanette becomes more prolific in the industry as a child actor and specifically as a child actor who can cry on cue. Now this is a very sought after skill for child actors because not all of them can do it. It takes a lot of emotion to be able to summon that skill the way an adult would. And so the way that Jeanette described learning how to do this was picturing her family perishing in tragic events. This was not necessarily difficult for her to do because her mom had been battling cancer this whole time from the time Jeanette was a young age, but then she started having to do it with other family members like her brothers or her grandpa. And she would just cry and cry and she became known as a kid who could do that. And that was a very sought after skill. But eventually, and this is one of the high points of the book for me, this whole anecdote, um, Jeanette is called into an audition to cry on cue and she can't. She doesn't feel it coming. It just, it won't come out of her. She's all cried out after having done this for who knows how long, who knows how many times, for who knows how many strangers. And after that, she feels really defeated. She feels like a loser. She feels like she let her family down by not being able to cry on cue. And so in the car, she tells Deb, her mom, that she wants to quit acting. And Deb responds by kind of going into this emotional tirade about how if she quits, their their family's gonna lose out on their chance to succeed and you know if you're putting that pressure on a young kid of course 
they're gonna be like, oh, no, never mind, never mind. I definitely wanna keep acting. That's not, you know, that's, I wanna keep doing that. I want to keep acting. Now, in addition to being able to cry on cue, another sought after skill or trait of a child actor is being able to play an age down just by how you look. So being able to look as young as possible is a beneficial asset. And it also ties into a theme of the book, which is Jeanette not really wanting to grow up. And so when she starts showing signs of puberty, she's disgusted and freaked out. And she goes to her mom, who's her one confidant in her life and is like, hey, is there anything I can do to stop this? Because it's making me uncomfortable and it's going to hinder my ability to act as a child. So Deb and Jeanette start restricting Jeanette's calories and they do this through a really barbaric and unhealthy and just terrible method. Um, they put her on a diet of a thousand calories a day and expected that to, you know, sustain her. And in order to impress her mom, Jeanette thought that it would be great to even start eating half of those meals that were, you know, planned out and pre-portioned to be a thousand calories. So this kid was presumably getting anywhere from 500 to 800, 900 calories a day because she thought it would please her mom. In addition to that, she would weigh herself five times a day. Her mom made this ritual of weighing her every single week and measuring her thighs and things like that. Additionally, there was another layer of abuse going on and another trigger warning for this as well, but Jeanette's mom would shower with her, shower her, give her breast and pelvic exams uh, to check for cancer, but that's clearly not what that is. So eventually Jeanette books her full-time role on iCarly. This is a big deal for her and her mom because it's her first permanent role on a sitcom. And Jeanette meets Miranda. She meets Nathan Cress, who play Carly and Freddie on the show. And she describes her relationship with Miranda as pretty wholesome. She says that Miranda is more kind of well-adjusted. She's been in the game for a long time. And she's sort of bewildered at the things that Miranda is allowed to do and the way she's allowed to carry herself. For example, Miranda's allowed to go get food by herself, which is something Jeanette would be never be able to do because her mom would be afraid of kidnappers. But despite that, Miranda and Jeanette actually form a pretty close relationship and they kind of do throughout the whole series. There's never any bad blood there, which is wholesome and I think probably much of a relief to a lot of people who were fans of the show back in the day. This is also around the time, obviously, that her relationship starts to form with the creator of iCarly. And she describes him as someone who could shower you with compliments and make you feel like the most special and important person in the world and then all of a sudden in, you know, the next minute be screaming at you and telling you that you're worthless and terrible. She also talks about um, some creepy behavior from the creator, including demanding that she be photographed in a bikini. In terms of sexualizing her, that's the only anecdote where she really refers to him being sort of creepy and predatory. So I don't think that this is the book that's gonna bring the creator to justice finally because he is no longer employed by that network, but I think it's a good starting point. I think it's a good way to get the conversation going. She also mentions a little later on in the timeline when Victorious came along, the creator would often try to pit the casts of the two shows against each other. For example, he would pressure the kids into drinking alcohol on both shows, and apparently the iCarly kids were a little more resistant to that and he would kind of peer pressure them and be like, oh, but all the victorious kids, they get drunk all the time. We need to give you guys some edge. And it's kind of fascinating because if you look at victorious and how those kids all came out, a lot of them, you know, if you look back at photos of them, look really like, look like they're fucked up. And I don't, I don't know what value that brings to the creator in terms of like having, you know, making maybe making it easier to play mind games if you feel like you're like the cool uncle of the set or like giving them alcohol to make them easier to control. I don't know. I It's obviously fucked, but that's kind of, those are kind of the two most damning things about the creator in this book. Wait, no. Wait, no, I actually forgot one other creepy thing she writes about. I, I guess I just block this out <laughs> after listening to it. But she writes about a weird anecdote where he had like a private dinner with her and he made her wear his coat while he like massaged her shoulders. So yeah, definitively very creepy thing. So I guess, yeah, three 
specific anecdotes about the creator of iCarly and Victorious being creepy and predatory, although there are others out there, they're just not referenced in this book specifically. So then iCarly goes on for a little bit, it becomes a big sensation, everybody, you know, starts to know Sam Puckett and they yell things at her on the street about the butter sock and eating fried chicken and she kind of just goes along with it but despises it generally speaking. And then the 2007 writer strike happens and so while iCarly is on hiatus, Jeanette's mom thinks it's a good idea for Jeanette to pursue a singing career, specifically in country music. And so during this time they plan this whole radio tour where she's gonna go to different radio stations across the country and sing this song and play in malls with kids to try to get her stuff in the country music radio rotation. At this time Jeanette's mom develops another bout of cancer and can't be there with her on tour to watch over her in the same way. Up until this point, Jeanette had been still doing this crazy 1000 calorie restriction diet. And so when there's not somebody there doing that with you and enforcing that, obviously you might go off track a little bit. And so she starts eating like a normal person would and reasonably gains a significant amount of weight enough from that for her mom to when she sees her mom the next time, her mom points out that she has gained weight and that it's a problem. This kind of progresses into a toxic cycle for Jeanette of a mix of anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. At this point, we get to around 2012, 2013, iCarly ends, Sam and Cat is in production, and Jeanette's mom's health takes a turn for the worse. And so to cope with this, Jeanette turns to alcohol and substances and is routinely waking up hungover and drinking every night because it makes her forget about her mom and the pain and all the stuff that, you know, she's going through at this time. Debra passes away and Jeanette vows that she's going to maintain her anorexia and her food issues and maintain a certain weight of, I believe, 89 pounds to honor her mom and please her mom in whatever the equivalent of Mormon heaven is, I don't know. Now, this is the other juicy production stuff, I guess, from the set of Sam and Cat. Uh, if you're not familiar with the show, I never really watched it, but it featured Sam from iCarly and Cat uh, from Victorious, played by Ariana Grande, and they were co-stars in basically another iCarly-like sitcom. Jeanette was very embarrassed by the show. She didn't like it. She wanted it to be her own spinoff, which the creator had promised her a few years earlier, but then they tacked Cat on. But Ariana Grande had just started her budding career as a pop star. She was really kind of taking off and Jeanette admittedly says that she felt jealous by that because Ariana had a very different upbringing than she did. And Jeanette almost felt like, you know, Ariana had the life that Jeanette could have had or maybe deserved. A lot of people on Twitter got mad about this. I really think she handled it gracefully and especially because they were young like and it would be totally normal to be in that situation if you have this crazy mom and you feel like you have no control over your life and then you see someone your age who's your co-star co who gets to go on all these exciting trips and gets to leave set to go do these singing opportunities. And, and the one anecdote that Jeanette says that she just couldn't handle was when Ariana came to set and said that she had spent the prior night playing charades with Tom Hanks. And from that moment on, Jeanette hated her, couldn't stand her, was very jealous of her. Admittedly, I'm not making this up. She says this in the book. So Jeanette says that she had been promised to direct an episode of Sam and Cat. She was so excited to direct. And on Monday, when they all get their sheets that have the listed directors for the episodes, her name is not on there. And she's understandably very upset by that because it's the one thing that she really wanted. And she's not really getting any significant answers from anyone. She's really upset and she has a breakdown basically. And after this breakdown, she's in her trailer or the studio or wherever. And she says that a producer comes up to her and they tell her that they really wanted her to direct. Everyone was on board with her directing, but that there was somebody else on the show who didn't want Jeanette to direct and went as far as to say that they would quit the show entirely if she was given the opportunity to direct and they just couldn't afford that. The network couldn't afford taking that loss and that's why she did not get that directing opportunity and that kind of 
scorned her until the end of Sam and Cat, which eventually wound down, got canceled. The creator was in a lot of hot water at this point. I think toward the end, she mentioned that he wasn't even allowed like in the same room as the actors because he was notorious for being so abusive. And then at the end of her tenure with the network, the network says that they're gonna give her $300,000, but she can never talk about her experience at the network publicly. And Jeanette, very you know makes a very smart decision and goes oh that's hush money i'm not gonna take that but now the pivotal moment in sort of the back end of this book is her having to discover who she is both without and without her mom both of those things in her life are gone essentially and so the rest of the book kind of talks about Jeanette's struggle with substance abuse and her eating disorder so she starred in some like one-off Netflix series that didn't do super well. And during that time, she's still restrictively eating. Um, she's still getting drunk a lot and feeling bad about herself. She's dating this guy who she met on the set of that Netflix show who is dealing with bouts of schizophrenia. Um, because of that boyfriend, actually, she decides to go to therapy because even he's like, you need help with your eating problems. And so she goes to see a therapist for the first time, Laura. And Laura is a big positive influence in her life for once. So Laura starts to kind of pry into the dynamic between Jeanette and her mom before Jeanette's mom died and comes to the very reasonable conclusion that a lot of what Jeanette's mom did was abusive behavior. And Jeanette just can't handle that because her mom to her for her whole life was her whole world. She was everything to her. And she writes about how her worldview therefore has to be shattered if you're accepting that your mom, who you've basically based your entire life and happiness around, was abusive to you. That means your entire worldview and foundation is a lie. And so Jeanette kind of can't handle this. She leaves the appointment, says that she's not going to be seeking out therapy anymore, and kind of continues this downward spiral with her and her boyfriend. He eventually gets treatment for his schizophrenia, but then develops a weed addiction and they just aren't compatible anymore because he's, you know, fighting his weed addiction. She's fighting her bulimia struggles. And so after this Netflix series is canceled, she decides that she wants to regain control of her life. And so she goes back to an eating disorder specialist and does that treatment and tries to come to understand the root of all of her issues and you know, obviously I'm not gonna say, and then it was a happy ending and then she wrote the book because healing from trauma like that is an ongoing process. It's not something that just, you know, you, you see a therapist, you click your fingers and you're done. I think now that her truth is out there, it brings up an interesting conversation about child actors and exploitation and the entertainment industry and how we don't check on people enough and how just because you're famous and you're wealthy and you're not sleeping on mats in a in a house anymore with your brothers doesn't mean that you have it all going for you you have it all figured out there are still a lot of abuses that you will be subjected to in the entertainment industry especially if you're a young woman but yeah that's a general recap of everything that happened in this book i would really encourage you to go read it or listen to it yourself i hit the highlights but there is still plenty of stuff that I didn't touch on that's just crazy just hearing it for the first time was absolutely insane it's really well written too like I like I said it's a book that touches on a lot of heavy subject matter but she approaches it in such a light-hearted way that it actually did make me laugh it kept me entertained it kept me shocked it made me sad it did everything I think that she was aiming to do with it um and so that's why I wanted to talk about it. It's definitely in my wheelhouse, but it's also something that I feel like other people need to read, especially when you consider how much more parasocial relationships have become with stars, with celebrities. I think it's an important read for everyone to grasp. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. And before I go, I just want to tell you to give me a follow on Twitter. Do it. Go follow me on Twitter. Go. Go right now. Okay, thanks. Bye.